Thank you so much. And I'll be giving informal comments, no slides, um, but Fine, greetings no all. Slide. Um, greetings all, and thank you so much, Dame Wendy, for this opportunity to reflect back and to share some experiences and perspectives from the early days of accessibility work at the World Wide Web Consortium. I'll mostly talk about the past with a few reflections on present day and a hope or two for the future. Um, I, I started working at W3C at a time when it was normal to keep paper records of the important things. In recent years, I've moved office a few times and had that um, odd archaeological experience of discovering treasures from the past, uh, sometimes treasures representing successful efforts uh, that took many years to build, and sometimes mementos of things we tried but failed at, but always learned valuable lessons from. Um, there was an appetite for making the web accessible and many hands that came together from different stakeholders in the process to accomplish what the community has over the years and is still working on. Um, Wendy, you'd asked me a few questions, including how I was recruited. <clears throat> and I still remember uh, that pretty vividly. In, in the spring of 1997, I got a call in, in the middle of my work day at my previous job the person on the other end of the line, Jim Miller, asked me whether I'd heard of the web. And I said, well, I'm sure, a bit. And he said there was an initiative starting at W3C to make the web accessible for people with disabilities. And they were looking for somebody to head that up. And I said, oh, that, that sounds interesting. He asked, you know, it would have to be cross disability. And I said, well, of course, that's the only way. And he said it would require bridging industry in the disability community. And I said, my experience so far had convinced me how important that was to bring communities together. And, and then he asked if I'd mind if it would require a lot of international work. And um, at that point, I, I burst out laughing on the call. And there was this dead silence on the other end of the call. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I, I've, I've just blown it. I'm in the middle of an unexpected interview and I've Put this person off and so I'm, I'm sitting there thinking how do I explain what I'm feeling and I, and I took a deep breath and explained that he was basically describing my dream job it was something that I had thought that that I've been thinking about in a way and had thought I would have to take five years to build the opportunity for um, but here he was interviewing me and I, I said please continue with your questions and so he did uh, and, and there's another part of the interview process that's still etched indelibly in my mind after I'd been interviewed by Tim Berners-Lee, which was intense and rather wonderful, and by Jean-François <laughs> Abramatique, mortifying myself at one point by attempting a few sentences of halting French. I interviewed with Michael Dertuzos, the giant of a man who was head of MIT's lab for computer science. And Michael asked me what I would be doing in this new position. Um, and I started to explain that I'd be working on accessibility of the web for people with disabilities. And he jumped partway out of his chair, demanding in shock, you're going to do what in my lab? He didn't think that this was part of computer science at that point. Um, taken aback, I replied, well, yes, this is why it's critically important for people with disabilities to be able to benefit from and contribute to the web. Uh, to his credit, within a few years, Michael came back to me. I'd gotten the job anyway. <clears throat> and he said he understood now that this is really important field that I was helping to build. Could he please introduce me to his book editor? And he became a great supporter and mentor. I, I've still got a book planned, but it, I've been a little bit busy trying to make the web accessible in the meantime. So, um, <clears throat> so what was it like working on web accessibility in the early days? On the technology side, we had massively underestimated the technical challenge. Part of our mission was to ensure that the standards that W3C develops support rather than act as barriers to accessibility. And that looked like a simple enough task when there were three of them, HTML, CSS, Cascading Style Sheets, and SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. We would analyze the standard while it was still in development and then for any barriers to accessibility, we'd raise an issue and try to help the relevant working group find a different way to address their goal without creating a barrier for some group of people with disabilities. For instance, fixed format and CSS was initially an issue and ensuring description and expandable SVG was an issue. 
But then the number of standards started multiplying till in a given year, we might need to review maybe 25 standards or 50 or more. And overall, W3C has produced hundreds of technical standards and the Web Accessibility Initiative, WAY, has reviewed nearly all of those to ensure support for accessibility. This is one reason why W3C standards are considered such a good foundation for digital technologies of all kinds to build upon. But WAY is known mostly for our work on accessibility guidelines, and these have been taken up by many governments around the world, as well as businesses, nonprofits, education, and more. I have to emphasize that what Way has achieved in this area has only been possible because of the extensive contributions of effort from so many individuals and organizations around the world. Developing accessibility guidelines across an expanding range of technologies requires exhaustive collection of requirements and information and on what works and doesn't and how these need to be phrased to be understandable by developers and testable by evaluators and monitors. One of the things that I've consistently tried to contribute over the years has been the importance of bringing people together from very different stakeholder communities and encouraging them to listen and learn from each other with respect. One of the issues we came across early on that recurs periodically is a reaction along the lines of, oh, good idea to build accessibility guidelines, we'll go do another set. Whereas what's most needed is a harmonized approach globally, which can be taken up more easily and where the testing and training resources can all be shared. I want to comment a bit as well on what the experience was like working in the W3C environment. It was always a mix, but never dull. I realized early on that for some of the people I was working with in the broader technology field, it was actually a shock for them to learn that people with different kinds of disabilities use the web or even computers, let alone that they worked, that we worked in technical fields. And, and some people seemed profoundly uncomfortable around people with visible disabilities. I used a scooter most of the time uh, for the past several decades. And sometimes I don't, and it was always very noticeable that for some people it was a very different interaction when I wasn't using that. But at the same time, I realized that my teammates at W3C by and large were incredible people who found the concept of digital accessibility to be an exciting challenge, a prolific innovation driver, and a very good fit for social values that they brought to their technical work at W3C in any case. It was such a pleasure working with Jean-François Jean Abramatique and working with Tim Berners-Lee, both deeply principled individuals with the rare ability to speak to people's better angels and move people towards a common goal. For me, I was on several steep learning curves at first because working inside W3C is a very unique environment. And there were many things that were outside of my experience. So for the first nine months, I averaged 90 hour work weeks to get ahead of those learning curves. Also, I was a woman in a very male tech field uh, that is still at times unwelcoming to women technologists. And I had a rare muscle disease that I was navigating. Of these, having the disability was the more frequent challenge, especially when traveling internationally. So outside of the technical debates and the guidelines debates, some of my more vivid memories include things like uh, a dear colleague, Ralph Swick, who spent part of my first staff meeting at W3C, eyeing my chair and couldn't restrain himself from starting to tinker with my chair during the meeting and turned it into a lifesaver uh, later on a trip to Southern France where he helped repair my chair real time after an airline had smashed it. Another colleague, Danielle Dardayer, who taught the whole W3C team how to play pétanque a Provençal version of the game of boule where the default rules of the game are accessible for wheelchair users. He was brilliant at social inclusion that built the feeling of a team working together towards a common goal. Later, I learned how to repair my own chair on the floor of the baggage hall in uh, Linz in Austria, and then on the floor of the baggage hall in Shenzhen, China, in the middle of the night after airlines had again smashed my chair so that I could attend meetings or presentations on schedule in the morning. 
Um, and so for me, part of the job was navigating hurdles to get to the job. And for most of the people that I know with disabilities who work in the web standards community, being able to participate in the dialogue is harder than we typically admit. And I would say, remember that when there's an opportunity to support a colleague uh, in their participation in the field. When it came to the development, so once the web developed further and accessibility was no longer a novelty, the climate did start to change some. When it came to the development of HTML5, accessibility was seen and sometimes treated as a hindrance. Proposals to address accessibility barriers were sometimes rejected over and over again. <clears throat> so uh, we got better at writing proposals for accessibility features and filing objections when our proposals were rejected again. But much of working on accessibility became an uphill battle for a while. Even later, once W3C had developed more rules of the road for maintaining respectful interactions in groups, the information technology field had moved on to agile development processes, and then a move fast and break things philosophy. This left little time for a holistic analysis of the accessibility impact of changes in standards under development. And standards and products and services, when they versioned up, often accessibility was what got broken when companies were moving fast. Uh, over the years, we've therefore also developed more agile accessibility review processes to try to keep ahead of the agile development process in industry, but it remains challenging. Another major change for accessibility at W3C in recent years is that the scope of W3C standards is so much broader than those three standards initially. It's no longer only PC-based or PC and mobile-based. It's web-based technologies on everything that touches the web, from automotive to virtual reality and everything in between. And we've got to try to make all of that accessible if we don't want to be excluding the billion and more people with disabilities around the world. The pandemic brought a whole new level of challenges as people pivoted onto virtual modes of collaboration for work as well as for everything in their lives. Much of video conferencing relies on at least some web standards. So it was great seeing accessibility supported uh, web-based video technologies become a lifeline through difficult times. At the same time, the disability community had to contend with inadequate accessibility of the early versions of all video conferencing services and only gradual improvement. Among the disability community, there's now a hope that hybrid meetings uh, will remain an option into the future as it provides more flexibility for accessible participation overall. Lastly, let me gaze into my crystal ball for just a moment. Um, W3C is in the midst of an important transition to a standalone legal entity at this time. Um, so as, as part of that, the entire organization is needing to rethink how we can best continue to be stewards of the web. A key issue that has emerged <clears throat> is how W3C will be governed in the future. My hope is that the organization will be able to continue as a nonprofit web community that builds a web that is accessible, internationalized, secure, trusted with good privacy principles, and also a web that's part of a worldwide energy efficiency effort in information and communication technologies, part of digital sustainability. So that's one of the things I'm also starting to encourage W3C to work on and start discussions on. W3C also has a long ways to go to be more racially, culturally, and gender diverse and inclusive. I'm optimistic about these prospects, uh, but it takes a vigilant and engaged community to achieve that. Um, it, it, thank you again so much for this opportunity to, to share these reflections today. <laughs>